This episode is brought to you by Never Second. Never Second is a system of fueling products formulated specifically for endurance athletes that provides a blueprint for success by allowing the athletes to test, optimize, and perfect their fueling and hydration. They take the guesswork out of performance fueling. I personally use Never Second on all of my training runs and my races, and I have no GI issues, and you know exactly how many carbohydrates you're taking in based on the names of the products themselves. If you want to try Never Second out, go ahead and use code SUBHUB25 to get 25% off of your purchase. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the SUBHUB podcast. I am Max King. And I'm Kimber Maddox, and we're back with an OCC post-race recap. We know with all of the great social media and media coverage from UTMB, everyone probably has already seen the results. Um, So we're just going to jump right into it. Um, On the men's side, no surprise on the winner, but also no lack of excitement. And on the women's side, a big surprise in the winner, at least from my perspective, but an equally exciting race for all those top spots. So uh, Max, who was our winner on the men's side? Yeah, so obviously no big surprise there. It was Stian Angermung, a good friend of mine. And Stian is kind of, um, you know, we... We kind of knew he was going to win, right? I mean, he's been world champion the last two two years in a row, um, been having an incredible summer. Uh, and they were kind of talking about him as being this, like he was Stan the Ninja on the commentary on the live feed because he just kind of hung out for a little while in the back, uh, in the middle of the pack, and then, then just came blazing through the field, uh, which was awesome to see. And what was exciting, though, was kind of that second through fifth or sixth positions. There was a lot of mixing up going on in there and a lot of racing, and it was really, really exciting. So we had Francesco Pupi in second, Antonio Martinez Gomez in uh, third, and Guan Yu Sheng in fourth, and Jeshurun Small in fifth, and Robbie Simpson in sixth. And so with those guys, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but I mean, a lot, a lot of changes and stuff. And that made for just this exciting race and not saying Stan wasn't exciting because he was um, coming from behind like that, but we kind of knew that was where he was going to end up. But uh, those other positions really exciting. So on the women's side though, Kimber, um, you know, like you said, Tony was kind of a surprise. Uh, She's been having a great year. So not a huge surprise should have been in there for sure. Um, and then Katie Scheid, she was right there in second, uh, Yao Miao, um, battling out this whole race. We talked about this in a little bit, but she was in second for so long, even in first for a long time, uh, yeah. ended up in that third position with Caitlin Fielder right behind her, Daniela Omimus, Omimus, and then Rachel Drake rounding out for that sixth spot and a huge shout out to Rachel there as well. Yeah, this was so fun to watch. And, um, I think we'll kind of go through the race and and let you all kind of hear how it played out. And so I think when you look at those results, you you only get a small glimpse of really what happened in the race because there was so much changing of position. There was there were people who went out fast and faded, other people who went out pretty strong and maintained it. Um, and on that women's side, yeah, just talking a little bit about Tony McCann, um, she was. I believe fifth at OCC last year. So no surprise to see her in those one of those top spots. Um, but she hasn't really had a huge breakout race like this. And um even this year, it hasn't been a perfect year of training for her. In in our preview, we talked a little bit about how um we actually both saw Tony at uh, the world championships in Austria, but she didn't race uh, because she had some little injuries that she wasn't able to do that. So she was there cheering on her team and Unfortunately, while she was cheering on her team, I think it was a mountain bike fall that she took, and I believe it was her collarbone that she broke. So that was in June. So a lot of that June to July time, um, from my understanding, she spent a lot of time on the bike and the bike trainer. um, So really hasn't spent months and months on her feet training, preparing for this. But we do also know she's been kind of living over in that Chamonix area or um, spending a lot of time over there, so familiar with the trail. So it was just so fun to see her uh, win. And we know that um, everyone loves Tony, her big smile, and just such a such a great person. So everyone was happy to see that. But we're excited right. to kind of talk through those other spots as well. Some just incredible ladies. For sure. And like for Tony, I mean, I think that's kind of why for us, it was a little bit unexpected, right? With the the injury coming, you know, not too far in front of this race. 
you know, you never know like exactly how an injury is going to affect a person. For me, I always feel like, shoot, if I get injured like that close to a race, I am down and out. I am, you know, fitness lags and it's, I'm not coming back for it. And for her, I mean, maybe that was just like a little bit of a rest break. You always hear about that of people like, oh, they got a little bit of a rest break and they allowed that, that training that they'd been putting in to kind of be absorbed and they actually become fitter while staying kind of, you know, getting some cross training in, uh, reducing like muscle wear and tear and stuff like that. So, and she ran, so I think you said this a little bit ago, how much faster this year than last year? Yeah, this is amazing. Um, so Tony ran, I think more than an hour faster than this year than she did last year. And, um, we will talk a little bit about the course and that they did make some changes to the course that sure. weren't huge, but big enough to definitely affect race times. We saw everyone running a bit faster, probably in that maybe 20 to 25 minute range faster this year. But Tony ran an, I think about an hour faster. And that really just reflects this kind of stepping up, stepping up to a new level, whether that's fitness or you know, more vert or mindset. Um, I do know Max will appreciate this. I do know Tony spent some time, I think, learning to um, do some Alpine touring on in on the snow this winter. So maybe that's where she gets that, those climbing legs really, really prepared for a race like this. I'm going in, I'm going with that because mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's been such a huge advantage, like just following what the Europeans do and skiing in the winter. Um, it gets so strong for some of that summer trail running and stuff. So um, before we get into like the the, the race specifics and that recap, uh, we want to give you guys just really quick, just an overview of the race, what OCC is and why we're covering it. So OCC, this race in particular, the reason we're following this race is it's the 50K distance for the World Series, the UTMB World Series final. So it's the shortest World Series final race that we're going to see all weekend. Uh, now we're going to start to get into the longer run ones like CCC and UTMB. Um, but because this is a Subhub podcast and we're interested in sub ultra running, that's why we're focused on OCC. We also, you know, sure, it's a 50K, even a little bit longer than a 50K, but we see a lot of those sub ultra athletes crossing over into this race because it is such a big event in the calendar. Um, and Kimber, give us a brief overview of the race as well, as far as the specifics of what we saw out there today. Yeah. So just thinking about what is OCC, we usually call it a 55 K cause that's typically what it was this year, a little bit shorter. Um, and usually it's going to be somewhere between 10,000 and 11,000 feet of elevation gain that they're covering. So like Max said, it is an ultra distance race. But we look at those, the name of start lists, and we see a lot of those sub ultra athletes, the ones that are competing in the Golden Trails races and some of the the other um, sub ultra races on that list. So we're really kind of just trying to shine a light on um, this particular event. Um, and with that, we know there were some just incredibly deep fields with that draw of like we mentioned in the preview, we have some of these longer distance athletes coming in like the Katie Shide types of athletes, but then also some of those shorter distance athletes, um, the Caitlin Fielders, Rachel Drakes. Um, so should we go ahead and just tell them a, a bit about the race? Sure. Let's do it. I mean, it was an exciting race and it was really fun to watch. Uh, it's kind of like one of the few times that I will w- sit there and watch a uh, race all the way through. And it, it's so cool to do. I mean, yeah, it's like six hours. So if you didn't have a chance to sit there for six hours last night and watch this race, this is why we're doing this. So we're going to go through, not step by step, but we're going to give you a brief overview, a recap of what happened during this race. Uh, Kimber, anything you know interesting about the start? Yeah, I mean, I think if you have a chance to even just go take a, a little glimpse of some of the vi- video footage of the start line, a few um, snapshots throughout the way, the race of the beautiful views and the course, and then seeing the finish, I would certainly recommend that. But um, I think right off the bat, um, just seeing the start line um, and having experienced the start line last year, it's it starts in a pretty narrow um, kind of road in this you know small town, so you always see it's it's crowded. There's a lot of energy, a lot of positive energy, but also that nervous energy of, do I need to get out hard and get to the front of the race? Or can I just sit back and, and kind of settle in? And so you take you see people taking different approaches to that. So, um, 
Yeah. What did we see in that first bit of the race? Well, I, I think one thing that was really surprising for me was to see Stian back behind, I think he was behind Ali Mack and Tony and a pack of the lead women. He was back there hanging out like on the streets through Orsier. And that kind of surprised me. He's not one to get out super hard, but I was kind of surprised to just to see him hanging out back there. Um, so that was surprising. Yeah. Yeah. And I think on the women's side, um, it was no surprise to me to see Ali Mack took it out um, pretty hard, um, yep. taking it in the lead. She was looking at some of her splits, I think split through the first 5K was similar to last year, maybe even a tiny bit more conservative. So nothing you know, out of the ordinary for her, we sort of expect that. Um, but what I was surprised about was who sort of did go with her and who didn't. So, um, you know, the people like Katie Scheid sitting a little bit further back, she might be someone I would expect to sort of go with that. Um, but then we saw pretty close behind her, um, Tony McCann, Jennifer Lichter, and kind of a whole string of, of others, uh, not too far behind her. Yeah, and I feel like I I saw, you know, the the uh, the big names were in there, right? I mean, even if they were kind of hanging out a little bit for the cameramen, it was pretty packed up and difficult to find some of some of these athletes in that bigger crowd, even amongst the guys and stuff. And I think they were all there, even if they were, you know, back a little bit in the field, they were really only maybe a minute or so at the most off of you know off the front or off of that kind of lead pack that was that was chasing Alley and stuff. Um, and so that wasn't too much of a surprise. Um, once you, so, you know, you run through RCA and then you start up the big climb up to Champay. Um, what was really interesting here is Tao Lu, uh, the Chinese guy, he started to push hard and I was really surprised. Like this is early in the race and yeah, you're, you're a good marathoner. I think the, on the live uh, feed, they were saying that he's a two twelve marathoner. So he's got some leg speed, which, you know, no surprise that, you know, he took it out through the roads, through the village, but then he pushed it hard all the way up to Champagne. Um, and so that was kind of surprising. And so he kind of like trying to break it open. I don't know, you know, it, whether that was his, uh, his strategy or not, but he definitely pushed it hard. So, uh, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, and I, I thought kind of like you were saying about Stian, um, it's always interesting to see someone that you don't expect to take it out hard. But I also almost get nervous for those guys that we expect to be in the top, like Stian, like, are you sure you want to let him go that, you know, get get that much of a lead? And um, obviously it worked out well. And, and we should trust that Stian, two time world champion at that kind of 45K distance, knows what he's doing. But um, it's always interesting when you see those big leads developing early in the race yeah and it's one of those things i always have a problem doing that right if i see somebody going i want to be up there with them to be out there i think stian is uh kind of a next level racer where he knows uh what he's getting into he knows his ability levels and he's comfortable kind of hanging out back there um and it's a very mature way of racing um one of which i have not been able to pin down very well in my career um, but he's very mature um, and and smart about it. So, yeah. So from there, if we we you know we got the start going, and really one of the big places where we see positions start to kind of form and see what's happening in the race a bit, we get to see have some good glimpses of people coming through the aid stations is at Champagne Lock. Um, so yeah, what what did we see happening as they were coming through the aid station there and kind of transitioning into a little bit of um, kind of more road, a little flat section. Yeah. So Champagne Lock, they get their first big aid stations about 12 K in, and then they start up the bovine climb. They get that section, like you're talking about through town. That's a little bit, uh, on the road, pretty flat for a little ways, but then they get that, that big next climb up the bovine and there, I mean, you really, you kind of saw all the usual suspects are there, right? Um, you're, you've got, um, you know, who's there you got a Jeshra and robbie poopy kind of in a in a good little group with stian right behind them what was surprising was tao lu and guan yo shing the two chinese guys still pushing hard taking it out but they weren't like too far they weren't detached from that front group so you had those five guys and then uh back from that we didn't see much on the live feed but back from that is you know the rest of your top 20 guys and stuff but so 
in the women's field, which I thought was pretty pretty cool and pretty interesting, was Yao Miao leading through Champay, pushing pretty hard, led all the way up the climb um, and then all the way down the climb too, all the way into Trien. Um, and so she she led for a really big part of that race. Um, and that was pretty interesting there. Yeah, and, and I know um, kind of coming through um, that aid station at Champagne Lock, we also saw, you know, Ali Mack had gone out pretty hard, but I was surprised to see um, Jennifer Lichter and Tony McCann weren't far behind and they kind of, Ali came into that aid station and they were just behind her. And so sort of coming out of that aid station, they were kind of together and then, and then uh, Tony and Jen sort of pushed a bit in there and um, created a, a bit of a gap. So at this point, Ali, I think, is back in fourth or so. We might not have these exactly right, those positions. It's sometimes hard to, to follow, um, ex- you know, where people are at in terms of exact position. Um, but pretty interesting to see, even at that point in the race, a lot of movement happening and several women pushing hard. So not, you know, not just one out there pushing hard and everyone else sitting back, but really several women kind of putting the pressure on was, was fun to see. Yeah. And right there, like I saw Jen Lichter right there and I was like, all right, she's, she's nailing it. She's got this. Like, um, you know, in, in my, in my pre-race, I'm like, okay, I'm calling it for Jen. And so she was right in that, that position, that sweet position right there. Um, and I, and I thought she was going to take it all the way to the finish and we'll talk about it in a minute, but didn't quite happen that way, but yeah. down to like 22 K down to Trient, um, you know, like Wan Yasheng at this point, he pushes that downhill and it was really fun to watch him like, just like crush that downhill. Um, and I don't know if like he really meant to do that or if he was pretty confident in his legs holding up for the rest of the race. Um, but he was going pretty hard at that point and I was getting a little nervous for him. Um, but you know, he was pushing it and props to him for just kind of going for it, putting himself out there and trying to win this race. Uh, it was pretty cool to watch. Yeah. That's a tough part in the race. I remember last year feeling really good on that part that's like descent into um Trient, like coming out of champe lock and then that descent feeling good moving fast like catching up with some of you know my my friends and kind of running with them but it it caught it caught up with me later i, I paid the price so it is it is a a tough it really does beat your legs up and some people are so prepared for that with their training and and getting a lot, a lot of those downhill miles in and um, some of us, you know, aren't quite as, as prepared for all that descending, but, um, yeah, so that was, a that was fun to see that. And I, and I know that, um, some people were surprised, um, that Guan Yusheng was the one really sending it on that downhill. I think they were expecting someone else to kind of, um, be the person to, to push through there. So always neat to see a surprise. And, um, I think this is also where we saw a little bit more shifting on the women's side. Um, from what I could tell, Ali Mo- Mack moved back up into third at this point. Does that sound right to you? Um, I think so. Maybe on the downhill there. On the downhill, yeah. Um, and then Katie Shide starting to move up a bit. And this is sort of where we saw Jen dropping a bit. So um, I agree with Max coming out of um, Champe Lock and seeing Jen kind of moving up. I, I felt like, oh, here we go. And, um, but we know that, um, things kind of started to, to get a bit tougher for her, but we, we still are, we still think Jen's going to have some big breakout races. She's coming back. She's coming back. Yeah. Yeah, And I mean, we saw like here in Trient, like that's the next big aid station. Right. And like, you kind of like, whether it's the climb before that or the descent down to into Trient, we start to see a lot of like shifting and stuff, all the top 10, they're comprised mostly of kind of who we expect to be in there. Um, and they're packed pretty tight still. There's not a huge gap between the top 10 and they're all kind of still in it at this point. But, um, you know, this is where we had a couple of drops, um, where some, some of that top 10 kind of after this started to move back and would eventually drop at about 30 K in. Um, I know, uh, uh, Nadir Maguette was third at this point and would eventually end up dropping um, as well. And so this is kind of where, you know, they're they're coming through Treant and they're 
starting up the Col de Balm, and this is where the race is really going to start to heat up. Um, and so this is kind of where it gets exciting. Yeah. So yeah, lots of lo lots of moves happening, and and I think um, yeah, like Max is saying, this is where we start to see, you know, those people who've done a great job pacing, they start to move up in the field and and gain some momentum from that, and those people who maybe pushed a little too hard on some of the climbs or the descents, we start to see, um, you know, people struggling a bit more. And so I think this is, is yeah, really where we, we see a lot of shaking up that starts to happen. Yeah. You know, when I, the other day when we were doing the pre-race and I said, well, that climb up the La Fajere, that is where people, that's where the race is going to be won. And that's where people are going to make their moves. Well, I was, I was one hill <laughs> too late. It actually was on this hill up the Col de Balme or Col de Bomb. This is where both Stan and Tony made their huge moves. And even the commentators on the live stream were like, well, they're not saving it. Like mo we, yeah. we expected people to save it for La Flagere and they didn't. Both of them just pushed here. Um, they obviously must have like, they were very confident. They, you know, in their training and stuff going in, they're both really strong climbers. So it's not, hugely like unexpected that they would pass some of the guys that they did. Um, but they did seem like very, very directed, very, uh, very big moves, um, into that first position. And this broke up in the race. Um, we had, you know, the three back behind Stian. Um, well, you had, uh, one, Yosheng, 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 sorry in second still and close close to stand but then we had the the threesome of jesharun um robbie and poopy right behind him um and but i mean you know stand make a big move on that climb to put a gap on all of those guys so that was that was huge yeah and i know watching on the women's side kind of watching that live stream we were sort of waiting to see who is in first there's oftentimes these moments in these trail races where you know you're somewhere where there's not perfect you know cell coverage to to get data different places you only get these certain checkpoints in terms of um specific positions people in are in so we're relying on those camera shots to see where are people and so i think for a little while we were kind of waiting to see is it uh yao meow that's in first is it tony mccann that's in first so um i think pretty neat to see Tony put that push in on that climb as well. And um, I just felt like Tony, it almost wasn't even like this was the big push. It was almost like she was just so strong and consistent the whole race. It's, it's really hard to know, but just from just watching, it just seemed like she was just strong and consistent, steady, um, and maybe other people moving a bit up and back. And she was just really steady. Um, and we did also see um, I mean, Yao Miao ran a great climb as well, staying in second for most of that. Uh, Katie shied into third, I think, on that climb if she hadn't already been there. Um, and we also saw Rachel Drake uh, had a good climb. I think she made her way up into fourth, maybe, on that climb. Um, I'd be right about that. Yeah, I think I think we, she was in fourth at that point, possibly. Yeah, so, so lots of uh, fun changes happening through... Uh, that area and um, maybe not always what, where we expect to see that. Yeah, that's super cool. I mean, that was like, you were, we were kind of waiting. We were watching the drone feed and the live feed. There were no cameramen on this section. I don't know if that was because they didn't expect any moves to be made there or what, but we're just kind of like sitting there with the drone footage, watching these little tiny dots run up to the coal, not really sure who it was. And so we were waiting for that drone to get close enough to the runners to where we could actually see who it was. Um, mm -hmm. And it was really cool to see it was Stian and Tony at that point. Um, and, you know, did they go too early? We weren't really sure. Um, but it was, it was cool to see that kind of break open at that point and some shuffling to be, uh, to be happening during that. So, um, yeah, absolutely. yeah. And then um, shoot, uh, after the coal, like you started to have that big downhill and, uh, you know, I got to give, Stian a, a big shout out right here because Stian didn't used to be the best downhiller in the world. Mm -hmm. He's always been a great climber, right? Um, and I've spent a lot of time with him and a lot of time on downhills and stuff too. And he's worked on that downhill ability for the past six years, specifically for races like this. 
Mm-hmm. And now he's one of the best downhill racers in the world. You watch him on the downhill and the mountain bikers behind him trying to keep up. And he just looks comfortable. looks smooth. Um, his footwork is really good on the downhills. And that's, it's not the fastest downhill. It beats your legs up pretty bad on that downhill because it's steep. Um, and there's rocks and roots and, and all of that stuff on that downhill into Argentier. And he looked smooth. He looked really good. So I got to, I got to give it to Stian and he's really worked on his ability to run that, uh, that type of course over the past six years. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and I don't know a ton about um, Tony's background in, in those things, but I will say coming off of a, a fair amount of time on the bike, I think that can be challenging all the downhill, the steep downhill. Um, so yeah, props to her too, just managing that well, the, the strong climbs, but then managing those downhills well. And she just, yeah, just cruising. She was um, really moving well, but yeah, on that, on that women's side, kind of in, in that area, we, still had those women pretty, those top three, pretty close together. You knew it was still a race and kind of fourth place, which we think was Rachel Drake and then some others kind of shifting back there. They were several minutes back. So at this point it was sort of those three. We had uh, Tony, uh, Tony McCann, uh, Yao Miao, Katie Scheid kind of were the top three, but they had some, you know, some more racing to do to figure out those top three spots. Yeah. And so then the next big aid station, Argentier, down there at the bottom of that of that downhill before they head up to La Flagere, we're kind of wondering, right, like what's going to happen now on this big climb? They've got one more big climb up to La Flagere and one more really big descent down into Chamonix. Um, and I think right there, you know, you're kind of wondering like, OK, how is this going to shake out? And this is where uh, things are going to get really interesting. At that point, on the men's side, kind of knew Stan was away. He's got enough experience. He's going to stay away. Um, but what's going to happen with, you know, Guan you know, Sheng was only a minute behind Stian, uh, and at that aid station, which, shoot, that's pretty impressive after that mm-hmm. downhill. He's still moving really well, um, looks really good. And then you've got Poopy, Robbie, and Jesh right behind him. Um, this big climb up love, up to La Flagere, those three, they kind of start to crack a little bit. Like they're they're breaking apart. They're not all three right together anymore. Um, and then Guan Yasheng, you see a little bit of him starting to crack a little bit as far as like he's still moving really well, but he stops at one point to fill up his water bottle. And you're like, oh shoot, like you do that, and you're 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 losing some precious time on that uphill. Um, and so it was kind of, you know. Pretty interesting to see what was going to happen um, there and, um, and what, you know, how that was all going to shake out. So, yeah, I thought it was interesting. I, I saw, you know, those, those three, um, Robbie, Jesh and Poopy come into that aid station together and they're all sort of filling their bottles together at the same spot. And um, I think Robbie was a little slower, taking his time a little bit more, knowing like, I really got to make sure I get the hydration and fuel that I need. So I think um, Josh and Poopy got out a little bit quicker. Um, but what I thought was interesting is hearing the common commentators talking about some of the splits. So split from Argentier up to that kind of final aid station at La Flagere. Um, they said, Stian, I think ran the fastest split that they have recorded. Yep. But then... Poopy followed that up with a faster split. And so we know that this is where um, Francesco Poopy really, you know, put put the move in to kind of break free from those other guys who were who were fighting for those last, you know, for that second and third spots. Yeah, he did. He absolutely crushed that climb and and put so much time on those guys. And um, it's no wonder, you know, he ended up in second because of that climb right there. Um, and like you said, he just like crushed that climb and, and ran the fastest time up that, uh, up that climb of anybody. Yeah. And he looked comfortable kind of sitting behind those other, um, guys before that. So, um, that was, that was neat to see it. It seemed like a pretty strategic move there. Um, and then on the women's side, a bit different from, from the splits that I was hearing, Tony came in, um, into left Legere about seven minutes ahead of, of Katie Scheid. So, Pretty big gap forming there. So, you know, substantially more than what CN had. So at that point, Tony's probably feeling like, okay, I just got to keep moving and keep my momentum going. And then, then I'm going to have this one in the bag. But um, 
Katie Scheid and uh, Yao Miao only one minute apart at that point. So still quite a race um, for that second and third spot uh, on that final climb. And that climb is tough. That um, Argentier to La Flagier, um, at least especially on the women's side, this is where you have a mix of some people are trying to run, some people are hiking, some people are going back and forth, mixing the two. And that can that can just be a, a game changer, whether or not you can keep running or if you have to um, switch to that hike. It is. It's it's so hard. It's late in the race and it's your final climb and you're giving it everything you've got. And that's what I saw from Yao Miao is the look on her face and her uh, her composure, the way she was running um, and her running form was definitely like it was starting to falter right there. And you could see that. And I think she had a really strong downhill, but um, she was working hard and, um, you know, just uh, the race was starting to take its toll right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting is that I, I remember running that climb, um, just separate from the race, like several days before the race, just running that climb and thinking, oh, this is, this is really runnable. This should be a great way to end the race. But when you have the uphills and the downhills and the miles in your leg, legs at that point, it's a whole different climb. So, um, those people like Tony who are able to, to keep running a bit more, uh, really can, you know, open up gaps or, or make up some ground in that time. So, um, and big, I, don't, I don't know if you caught it, but we haven't said Antonio's name at all. Right. And so coming down into the finish line, we haven't talked about Antonio and he comes from somewhere back in the back. We don't even know. I mean, we can get his uh, place off the splits and stuff at Argentier, but he just, he has a great climb and a, a monster of a downhill and runs himself onto the podium by the time he gets down to Chamonix. That, um, that was pretty impressive to see, uh, to see him kind of come out of not nowhere. You know, we know he's a good runner. We were talking about him before. And like I said earlier, I don't know that much about him, but expect him to be in the mix. We hadn't heard anything about him all day long. And then all of a sudden he comes across the line in third place. Uh, and that was, that was pretty impressive. So good race yeah. from Antonio. That is such an interesting thing to note. I think that's just occurring to me now as well. Like, yeah, we didn't hear about him all day where, you know, and maybe that's, maybe that was an intention, just flying under the radar, sitting back and putting a big um, push in late in the race. But um, it would be fun to uh, go back and look at some of those splits and see where was he at those different points in the race? Like, where was he at these different aid stations? Was he right there in the hunt? And we just, didn't quite see him near Robbie and Jeshrin and these other guys. So pretty interesting note there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, you know, when you're kind of focused on the front of the field and seeing what's happening up there, you don't always pay attention to kind of what's happening in, in the back of the pack. Right. Um, but you know, there's going to be some shuffling around. You just don't know who it's going to be. So you don't quite know who to follow. You can go back after the fact and we can kind of figure out where he was and stuff, but uh, it's just it's cool to see him run into into that third spot. Guan Yao Sheng sticks it out. Um, I've got to say, like for how hard he pushed in the beginning, like coming up with that fourth spot is huge for him. Um, Jesseron uh, came out in fifth and like he like just hung on. And Josh, I have to apologize right now because I didn't mention you during the the pre race, um, like the pre race overview. And you are the man to sneak in there for the Americans into that top 10 with an incredible race. So good on you, Jesh. Like, nice job um, and huge congratulations in that fifth spot there. So. Yeah, well, let's let's finish it out, get them to the finish line with our top three, but then our, also our top 10. And then we'll kind of maybe uh, give some of our takeaways. So from that that final aid station, La Flagier, that's kind of top of the last climb in OCC. And you just have, it's all downhill to go, but I think you have about 5K or so. And um, on the women's side, Tony, strong lead, but she still ran strong on that downhill. She looked great. If there had been someone with her at the top of that, she would have um, left him in the dust. She looked great. Um, and so fun to see her cross the finish line. Lots of emotions, 
so happy. And I think the crowd was so happy to see her win that. Um, Tony is uh, from South Africa, so we don't see a lot of South Africans topping the podium at OCC. So really cool to represent there. Um, and then followed pretty closely, we had Katie Scheid in second and Yao Miao in third. That was a race to the finish. They really, I, I would have to go back and look at exact times, but I think they were, mm, I think less than 40 seconds apart, definitely yeah, less I than was, a minute. Yeah, I was going to say 30, 40 seconds, something like that. Yeah. So you, so on that descent, I remember watching Katie Scheid and she's pushing. She's also kind of checking back behind her, you know, trying to figure out are those cheers for another athlete? Are those just people cheering for me? Um, and so she really had to push all the way to the finish, but great job to Katie just finishing it out in that second spot. And then um, Yao Miao coming in strong as well. So, so close behind Katie Scheid. Um, pretty fun to see. Um, just that mix of of athletes that we weren't quite sure, you know, who to expect to be in that top three and on the top of the podium. So that was our top three. Um, following that up, we've got um, Caitlin Fielder, who was in fourth, Danielle Emus in fifth, Rachel Drake in sixth. Um, and it goes on from there, but I want to give a shout out to Rachel Drake. I also didn't uh, call her out in too much in the pre-race, but Rachel, we all love Rachel and um, she's come off of, you know, postpartum having a baby. Um, and then she had a stress fracture soon after her return to running. So she has been working hard to get back, uh, racing her way into fitness. And this was just kind of like uh, just a good um, way to prove to herself that she's back. And we um, expect to see a lot more from Rachel. So super exciting race. And, you know, we got to kind of watch what happened, watch it unfold. That was pretty exciting. Um, and so we just wanted to kind of leave it off with a couple of takeaways from the race. You know, we saw Kimber, we saw conservative starts from, I would say, Stian, Antonio, a little bit from Katie that really paid off. Mm -hmm. We saw a couple of hard pushes from the start. Some didn't work out, um, but a couple of them, like, didn't end up with a podium spot, but at the same time, they still held on to good positions. Mm -hmm. I don't know for that. For me, that kind of speaks to like just how many different ways there are to run a race, right. And still finish in a good position. You can go hard from the start. You can start conservative and run through the field. Um, that's what's, I don't know. One of the coolest, the coolest things about this sport is the ability to kind of run your own race however you want to, and still end up in a good position. So that's cool to me. Yeah, I, um, I agree with that. That's It's fun to see people approach it in different ways. And maybe those people who went out hard and ended up in fifth or sixth, maybe that was still the best way for them to run that race. So neat to see that. Totally. I mean, and you can comment all day long on, oh, they should have done this, or they should have done, done that. Honestly, like I've run enough races now to know, like, you know, you run the best race you can on that day however you decide to run it and it, it is what it is and that's how it comes out and you can always say woulda coulda shoulda but in reality you can't take that back and, and go back and do it a different way because the next race that comes along is totally different from the race you just ran so there you have it um i will say so i don't know if you agree with me there or here but american women they didn't have the day that they wanted or at least i would expect to, or what we expected. I mean, when we looked at it on paper, right, we saw the top five spots, basically all uh, American women on paper. It didn't materialize. Uh, we had one in the top 10, I believe it was, um, surrounded by a lot of Europeans, um, China, um, and other, other athletes and stuff. So, you know, to say, I'm not really saying anything about it other than I think that they didn't have that they, the day that they wanted to have. So. Yeah. And I, I think one thing to note there is, you know, as we talked about kind of those top women that we, we saw in the rankings, we were looking at those OCC specific rankings, 50 K specific. If we'd put those women in the order of their UTMB overall index, it would have looked different. We would have seen Katie Scheid and Yao Miao up there much higher. Um, and so maybe that speaks to a race like this maybe suits those kind of more true ultra athletes a bit more than the than the sub ultra athletes. I'm not really sure. Um, but also just 
to, to those American women out there, I think um, we're pr so proud, of, so proud of Rachel Drake coming and representing and so proud of Katie Scheid doing that as well. And we're even proud of the people who didn't have the day that they wanted to. I'm so impressed with Allie Mack. She went out hard and I think she went out wanting to win this race and she didn't have the day she was hoping for. I believe she finished in 14th. I might have that off by a position or two. Yeah. Yeah, but what I was right. impressed with is that she finished the race. It would be so easy for someone who we expect to be in some of those top five positions to, to recognize it's not their day and not make it to that finish line. But she she saw it all the way through, made it to the finish line. That is always an impressive feat. Um, and we also know there were people who got on the starting line knowing their body probably wasn't 100%. And that's such a brave thing to do as well. Um, and so we're proud of everyone who got on that finish line or on that start line, whether they made it to the finish line or not. Um, it's always a brave thing to to take a swing. Absolutely. And I love the way Ally Mack races. I love seeing her like take it out hard and just go for it from the start. Um, I mean, that's how like that's how I like to race a lot of the time. So huge props to her for just finishing that, that out. And I do stand corrected, Kimber. There were two uh, American women that top 10. Um, uh, when I, I mentioned one a moment ago, so, um, certainly, I mean, yeah, to your point, not, um, not bad. Right. And it, they certainly deserve, um, all of the props that uh, we've given them and that they get from everybody else out there. Cause they did a great job racing. Um, and I, but I will say like American men, I feel like did pretty well. Um, Josh running into that fifth spot when we, you know, didn't even mention him during the preview. Um, he, uh, he stuck it to us and did really well. Nick handle in 11th Cole in 14th as well. So we had three guys in the top 15. Um, that's a, you know, when we were kind of in the preview thinking, okay, here, like, you know, one of them breaking into the top 10 is going to be pretty good. They did that. And plus they had an 11th and 14th. Um, that's pretty good. Cole, I will say, I don't know what happened out there um, for him to come up in 14th, uh, whether that's a good day or bad day for him. I don't know. I haven't talked to him yet, um, but I will say good job, buddy. Um, proud of you for that 14th finish in that really, really strong field. So nice job. Um, and then um, I, China, like, wow. Yeah, like wow, good. Yeah. we were talking about him all day long and I don't, I don't know, Kimber, like, we don't do that very often. Right. right? Uh, is that just yeah. me? I, I don't know, but they did really well. Um, they came away with, um, a podium spot, a fourth place, a sixth place, I believe. Um, and just like we were talking about them all day long, they're having great races. I hope like we will start to see more of them in international races other than just here at UTMB. They've had some other races, um, like, um, Yao Miao has, she won CCC. Um, and so they've had other good results in UTMB races, but we don't see them much the rest of the year. Hopefully with this, um, gives them some confidence. Hopefully they, they can get out and get around the international circuit. And we see them a little bit more throughout the year. Cause I mean, that's a whole, you know, whole nother group of racers that we don't get to race very often. And that was pretty cool to, to see. So I guess we'll have to have to wait and see on that um but that was that was cool so yeah so fun to see that I, looking here it looks like there were on the men's side three in the top 10 and then of course on the women's side a third place finish so neat to see that and i'm sure there's some um aspect of covid and lockdowns playing into not seeing them in some of these races in these last several years so neat to For see sure, yeah. them kind of showing up there but maybe that also means we need to go race you know in <laughs> Uh, China and those surrounding countries a bit more um, because I think a lot of these people did come in a bit under the radar and unknown. We look at their race results and we don't really know those races as well as the ones that we know in the U.S. or in Europe. So um, maybe maybe it's us that needs to kind of get over there a little bit more. Um, you, know, so you, you might be right. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, you're, uh, you're probably right about that. So we need to get over there a little bit more and go race some of their races. So yeah. I bet they have some phenomenal races in China that we, we don't even know about. Um, yeah, so. absolutely. That would be fun. We'll, we'll, we'll add them to our race calendars, but, um, well, I've got a long race calendar that I can't even get through as it is that I could keep adding races to these race calendars. And I have, I have limited number of days in me. 
Well, no, I think Max King is an uh, unlimited <laughs> running career, right? And you'll be racing till you're about 80. So you got lots of races left in those. That's legs. true. That's true. I think you're right about that. I just don't, I still don't know if I can get to all of them. So my, my bucket list of races is really, really long. I'm sure yours is as well. Yeah. So I feel like it's always growing. It's never shrinking. So no, that does no. make it hard. Yeah. Well, this has been fun. Thanks for letting us guest host and um, congrats to Tony and Sian and everyone else, not only those who were on the podium and in the top 10, but everyone who took a swing, everyone who made it to the finish line. We know it's always an accomplishment. Um, so we uh, thanks for just letting us follow along. It's, it's such a fun thing. Um, any last words, Max, before we wrap it up? No, just to reiterate that, though, I mean, Thanks for letting us uh, letting us host the podcast as, um, you know, just jumping in here, doing uh, doing what we can to cover a race. And uh, Danny and MK heal up, rest up after that effort, um, come back stronger. And thanks for letting us be here. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. This has been the Subhub Podcast brought to you by Free Trail. Just a reminder for you guys that this episode is brought to you by Never Second. Check out the show notes for a link to their website, their Instagram page, and use code SUBHUB25 at checkout to get 25% off of your purchase. That's SUBHUB25. 